Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Andrew is part of our research seminar, and I actually want to begin just by echoing uh, uh, what Ed Barrett said in his talk. This is a seminar that uh, meets all year long. Uh, Ed, uh, I should say, uh, who never boasts, uh, I'll boast for him, he organized the entire curriculum on moral virtue and moral injury for the seminar. Um, you've heard a number of the members of the seminar speaking today, uh, Maggie uh, and Andrew. Uh, Andrew, I should say, is uh, just uh, told me that he's uh, been awarded the Knight Hennessy Fellowship Scholarship to uh, study at Stanford University. Uh, and, uh, um, and I also want to say that uh, um, being with this outstanding group of MIDs and fellows, faculty, colleagues, uh, uh, it's uh, just uh, been uh, uh, a privilege to spend a year learning with uh, such an outstanding group. Um, so I, I just want to thank you, and I want to thank uh, I want to thank Joe and the Stockdale Center. Uh, we're now in my sixth year, uh, and it's just been an, uh, an eye-opening, transformative experience for me. And men and women often come out of war injured, some physically, some mentally, and some morally. That's true for both civilians caught in a battle space and for the warriors fighting in it. Uh, our focus here, obviously, is on the wounded warriors uh, and those specifically whose wounds are moral, though, of course, they might also have physical and mental injuries. Uh, there are now several uh, remarkable books about uh, moral injury to warriors, drawing on in-depth interviews with veterans. Among them, I'll single out uh, uh, Jonathan Shea's uh, Achilles in Vietnam, uh, the reporter David Wood's What Have We Done, and Nancy Sherman's After War. All of them are rich and compassionate and powerful. More recently, I was struck with an article that I'd recommend to you by uh, the journalist A.L. Press uh, called uh, The Wounds of the Drone Warrior, which was published in the New York Times Magazine. Now, all of these are sources for what I'm going to talk about today, uh, which is atonement as a kind of response to one kind, or actually uh, one family of moral injuries. Uh, but my main source on what atonement consists of is going to be a little bit unusual. I'm going to draw on writings by medieval rabbis. Uh, that's in the second half of today's talk. Before I get there, though, uh, let me set up the problem as I understand it. Thankfully, we've come a long way from the notorious moment in August 1943 when General Patton slapped a combat-stressed soldier and called him a goddamn whimpering coward. Patton's cruel action, which General Eisenhower later made him apologize to that soldier for, is an example of one destructive way some warriors view combat trauma, including their own. Suck it up. Stop whining. Go back out there and play the game. Built into that view is a tremendous fallacy. The physical injury may be real, but mental injury is, well, it's all in your head. Uh, it was a big advance when we began to recognize combat stress and PTSD as authentic, genuine moral conditions, uh, conditions as real as bodily injury. Recognizing combat stress as a medical condition was a step toward compassion and a step toward treatment. But medicalization may not be enough. I first heard the term moral injury here at the McCain conference about five years ago uh, from an army chaplain uh, who I don't think is here and whose name I've unfortunately forgotten. And he underlined something crucially important that was a real light bulb moment for me. Uh, when an injury is truly moral, it needs to be treated morally and not only therapeutically. Of course, therapy is better than simply sucking up the pain. And it's infinitely better than Patton's uh, crass disbelief that the mental is real. But moral injuries may need something more than therapy. The question is, what does moral treatment involve? Now, I think there's no one-size-fits-all answer, because moral injuries can take many forms. I'm going to be focusing 
on just two subcategories of moral injuries. Uh, those where the warrior has actually done something wrong, plus those where the warrior wrongly, falsely believes that he or she has done something wrong and can't shake that feeling. So just to use Ed's terminology from earlier, the, uh, those where remorse is the right response and those where the response should be, so to speak, downgraded to regret. Uh, but it'll help to look at moral injury more generally and that's where we should start. So obviously the term moral injury corresponds to physical injury as Nancy Sherman said this morning, these are metaphors. Um, but let's look, just to cash out the metaphor, uh, at the three harms that are entailed in a physical injury. They are, first of all, pain and suffering. And second, the loss of functionality. For example, the loss of eyesight, or the loss of limbs, or mobility. The third harm is not as common, but it's equally devastating. Uh, that's disfigurement, becoming physically shocking in the eyes of others. The three injuries don't inevitably go together. Uh, usually, uh, I want to say always, but uh, it's always a mistake to say always. Usually, a physical wound causes pain, but not everyone loses functionality after the wound is healed, and of course, not all wounds are disfiguring. Even so, all three of these modes of injury matter. Now, I think we can think of uh, moral injury along the same three dimensions. It involves subjective pain and suffering, typically in the form of guilt or shame, but also other emotions and states of mind. Fear or rage or endless hyperarousal or a sense of personal worthlessness. Um, it can cause a loss of belief that there's a moral order in the universe. Jonathan Shea noticed that the mantras that the Vietnam vets that he was working with often used to shrug off their pain and loss. There were two of them, uh, don't mean nothing and fuck it. Eventually, and here I'm quoting his language, spread out to engulf everything valued or wanted, every person, loyalty, and commitment. So that form of pain and suffering is what philosophers call nihilism, the loss of belief in everything, and it can be devastating. Second, moral injury can include a loss of moral functionality, uh, and that's where virtue ethics comes in. In the language of virtue ethics, a harm to character that affects uh, the three dimensions uh, a warrior's agency. This is something that Alicia talked about in her uh, presentation earlier, or the loss of moral judgment. Uh, or the ability to act in ways that lead to the person's own flourishing back in civilian life. Uh, Shea's words once again, the moral dimension of trauma destroys virtue, undoes good character. Uh, in our research seminar this year and in his talk today, uh, Ed uh, has emphasized this point over and over, and I think rightly, moral injury is not simply feelings of guilt or shame, which everyone expresses sometime, or experiences sometime or other, because we all mess up. What defines moral injury is something deeper and more long-term, change in character or personality that erodes virtue, understood in any of the ways that virtue ethicists understand it, and I've mentioned three, uh, having to do with the ability to act, to judge, uh, and uh, the third, to flourish as a person. And third, moral injury can include disfigurement, personality changes that make the morally injured warriors repellent or strange or difficult to be with in the eyes of those around them, especially when they come back to civilian life, and that can include spouses or other loved ones. A Vietnam vet said to Shay, I carried this home with me. I lost all my friends. I'd be sitting there calm as could be, and this monster would come out of me with a fury that most people didn't want to be around. And that can create a vicious spiral if the veteran feels ashamed or guilty about repelling loved ones. That shame and guilt can ripen into an independent moral injury of its own. So to make all of this more concrete, uh, I'm going to. Uh, when I think about some of David Wood's uh, interviews with uh, vets who had been morally injured by their accounts with children. And that uh, could include uh, 
uh, Lane McDowell, who Nancy talked about this morning, uh, Wood interviews Nick Rudolph, a Marine in the unit that Wood was embedded with in Iraq. Nick killed an 11-year-old boy who was shooting at him, spraying automatic weapons fire all around. It was a justified shooting from every objective point of view, from the point of view of the law, from the point of view of the rules of engagement, from the point of view of basic moral principles of individual and collective self-defense. But to Nick, it still mattered that he had violated something basic to his own moral code. You don't shoot children. Wood asks him, will the moral injury fade in time? And Nick answers, no, it will all be there. Another Marine, Sendio Martz, grew so mistrustful of Afghani children who the Taliban used as spies that when he returned home, he couldn't be around any children except his own daughters. He couldn't go to the movies or even attend his daughter's dance recitals. Um, the third example is uh, uh, Stacy Pearsall, who was a combat camera in the Air Force. One day, uh, she almost shot an Iraqi kid running at her. I mean, she, he ran at her, she pulled her gun. Uh, the kid only wanted a soccer ball. Thankfully, she didn't pull the trigger, but here's what she says. It definitely made me look inward at myself, like what kind of woman am I? Women are made to make life, not take it. It was a moral thing and it changed how I think of myself. Now, if I see a group of kids, I'm walking the other way. In the long run, that incident persuaded me not to have kids of my own. Now, here you see all three dimensions of moral injury. <clears throat> Subjective pain and suffering like Nick's. Loss of functionality. Uh, and becoming strange like Sandy Omar did, strange in the eyes of his own daughters. Now, uh, a decade ago, Shira McGann and her co-authors defined morally injurious acts as uh, perpetrating, failing to prevent, bearing witness to, or learning about acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. Now, I'm going to focus on moral injuries of the first two types, and that's perpetrating and failing to prevent and I think what I have to say is not going to be as relevant to the others which are bearing witness to or just learning about uh, such acts. Uh, so let's start with an example of perpetration. Um, this is also from Wood's account. A US soldier deliberately shoots an enemy fighter in the stomach, not the chest, so he'll die more slowly and painfully. It's probably not a crime, but it violates the principle, the just war principle, um, against inflicting unnecessary suffering. And in this case, the soldier knew almost instantly that it was morally wrong, and it haunted him afterward. Back in civilian life, he medicated himself with drugs and became an addict. Uh, but what he really needed was not pain relief, but guilt release. Second are the failures to prevent, not culpable actions, but culpable omissions. They're particularly devastating when the warrior thinks his own buddy has died because he messed up by failing to do something he should have done. This is an incredibly complicated set of emotions. It mixes moral self-loathing and grief and survivor's guilt in a toxic package that's really hard to sort out. And the, the culpability might not be real. It might not be there. Uh, the bare suspicion that he'd messed up and done something negligent can lead to endless self-guessing um, and self-flagellation about what I might have done to make it come out differently. Sometimes, as Nancy Sherman writes uh, in After War, that's a mistake that comes from ha coming into this with an inflated sense of control. Uh, if we didn't think that we were controlling it, then the fact might just turn out to be that I was lucky, my friend wasn't, and there is no more to the story. But as, as the person replays the disaster movie in their heads, we can always think of something we might have done differently, some precaution, no matter how far-fetched we could have taken, that would have changed everything. So the warrior thinks, maybe my survivor's guilt isn't irrational. Well, 
is it or is it? Is it rational or real? The question itself can become a perpetual torment and the temptation to keep replaying that movie, to look for the place where you messed up is a devastating moral injury. Uh, and there can also be a kind of false blaming of yourself for the first category, the perpetrations, not the omissions. Uh, think of uh, justified or excused actions like Nick Rudolph's killing of the 11-year-old boy, or for that matter, Stacy Pearsall's pulling a gun on a child. Neither of them actually did anything wrong, but to them that didn't completely matter. They were in the space of remorse, not the space of regret. Uh, for both of them, a line had been crossed. The prohibition against shooting a child is exactly the kind of deeply held beliefs whose transgression causes moral injury. As David Wood defines moral injury, it's a jagged disconnect from our understanding of who we are uh, and what we and others ought to do and ought not to do. Stacy now had redefined herself as a potential kid killer and it changed her. Now here's one last category of actions that uh, make warriors guilty in their own eyes. Moral injury can come from the warrior's sense that the campaign was a mistake, that he or she shouldn't have been out there killing in the first place, no matter that the killings were all permissible under the use in Bello and the ROEs. Brandon Friedman, an army lieutenant in Afghanistan, wrote, I had always wanted to fight, but I never wanted any part of something like this. I was a professional soldier. I wanted to believe in my work. Instead, I was watching as politicians with no military experience hijacked the army. And that thought can change the moral status of the killing in the warrior's own eyes as she looks back. If she thinks she's killed to no good purpose, then she may echo US Marine Chuck Newton. You probably shouldn't be killing your own species. Uh, in his new bestseller, uh, which I strongly recommend, about the Northern Ireland uh, troubles, uh, uh, that's called Say Nothing, Patrick Radden Keefe, who's the author, reports that some IRA soldiers, or if you will, terrorists, suffered severe moral injuries when they realized that they had killed but never accomplished anything that would justify killing. Now how to deal with all this? One worthy goal of, of professionals who work with morally injured warriors is to help them attain self-forgiveness and as Nancy has said, self-empathy. Uh, Nancy writes about that self-empathy beautifully in After War. The tack I want to take in the time remaining to me is a little different. It starts from a fundamental moral proposition and that is this, forgiveness without atonement is cheap forgiveness. What these morally wounded warriors need in order to forgive themselves is to atone for the wrong they did or else come to understand and, earn and internalize why they have nothing to atone for. Uh, that may not be enough to ease their psychological pain, so even after atonement, they may still need therapy and still struggle with their injuries, but I want to take heart to heart the chaplain's proposition that I heard here five years ago, moral injuries need a moral response, and that's what atonement is. But what does atonement involve? Here I'm going to draw on writing from the rabbinic tradition and especially on ideas about atonement spelled out by uh, Moses Maimonides. Now I realize that Maimonides is not exactly a household name. So I'm gonna start this part with a thumbnail bio. Uh, Moses ben Maimon, no, Moses the son of Maimon, the Maimonides is Greek, was a 12th century rabbi who led an eventful life. He grew up in Cordoba, uh, in uh, southern Spain during the Spanish Golden Age when Muslims and Christians and Jews lived together in harmony. That Golden Age ended when Berber fundamentalists from North Africa invaded and Maimonides fled from Spain in the face of religious persecution. Uh, after 20 years of wandering through North Africa and the Holy Land, he settled in Cairo and became the leader of the Egyptian Jewish community. Uh, he was a doctor by, a prof by profession and reputedly the greatest doctor of his time. Uh, he's got uh, medical books uh, uh, on the treatment of asthma, 
Um, this is one that you'll undoubtedly want to run out and read, uh, Maimonides' treatise on hemorrhoids. Um, uh, he, uh, um, he became personal physician to the royal court and he ran a clinic for his own community at night. Uh, but Maimonides was also the preeminent Jewish legal scholar of his era and one of the greatest philosophers of the Middle Ages of any religion. Uh, his masterpiece was The Guide of the Perplexed, which Thomas Aquinas studied uh, very thoroughly. Uh, the greatest doctor, lawyer, philosopher, and rabbi, as my wife likes to say, his mother must have been so proud. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one of Maimonides' amazing achievements was codifying a thousand years of Jewish law. Um, and that's what I'm going to be drawing on. So let me say a word about what that means. Jewish law comes from uh, the Torah, the five books of Moses that are at the core of the Hebrew Bible. But along with those hundreds, over 600 biblical commandments, the tradition holds that there's an equally important law communicated orally from God to Moses that was never written down, but rather passed along by word of mouth from generation to generation. The two centuries after the Romans destroyed the Jewish kingdom, a group of survivor rabbis codified some of it in a fat volume called the Mishnah. 500 years later, rabbis in what was then the great scholarly center in Baghdad wrote a 70 volume commentary on the Mishnah called the Talmud. The Talmud takes the form of an elaborate argument among legendary sages on what the various sources of law mean. And a lot of their debates are left unresolved. So the result is a huge, untidy mess of dueling interpretations. Maimonides made it his task to codify all of this, to put it in orderly form, to resolve the disputes, and to provide rational explanations for every rule, no matter how weird or puzzling. Now, to get some idea of what this means in contemporary terms, imagine a military officer who decides to codify all the rules and regulations of the US military, going back to George Washington, including all the unwritten traditions of all the branches. And imagine that uh, she's doing that in her spare time while practicing medicine 14 hours a day. And by the way, she's also answering legal and ethical questions posed from a remote bases all over the world. Um, during her career, she'll also write a philosophical masterpiece and those books on hemorrhoids and asthma. Uh, Maimonides also wrote one on the, the treatment of sexual dysfunction at the behest of the royal family. And having a, read a little bit of it, I want to just say, don't try this at home. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is, uh, he also wrote, uh, and a treatise on celestial navigation. He's got an astronomy book as well. Uh, also, at the same time, negotiating on behalf of the US with the Afghan government and leading prayers twice a day. Uh, all of that after having spent 20 years on the run as a refugee. Um, now, as you probably, that, so much for the, how to put it, the cultural boast. Uh, 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 on to, uh, back to content. Uh, as, as you probably know, in the Jewish tradition, ritual atonement takes place every autumn on a holiday called Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement. Like every aspect of daily life in traditional Judaism, there are rules and regulations about how to observe Yom Kippur. And Maimonides' code included a chapter on the laws of atonement. Now, Judaism is very different from a religious tradition like Catholicism, where confession and repentance are individual and happen throughout the year. Uh, that is true to an extent in Judaism. But in addition, there is this special day of fasting and prayer for collective atonement. Now, in some religious traditions, confession and prayer lead to absolution, wiping the sin away. Jews don't talk about absolution. They talk about atonement, not making the sin disappear, but trying to cover it by making it right. Um, and in fact, the Hebrew word uh, kippur comes from the word for cover. And I want to say that atonement, not absolution, is the right model for moral injury. The mental health professionals who work with morally injured warriors agree that in many cases, the moral injuries are not going to go away. Uh, in Shea's words, return to normal is not possible. That means that absolution, 
taken in its literal sense of return to innocence is not a realistic goal. Atonement just might be. Now, before we look at what Maimonides' laws of atonement, I want to pause for a couple of personal asides. I don't usually speak or write about religious topics, and I am not a scholar of uh, Judaism. I, you know, unlike Admiral Baker, I only know a couple of words of Hebrew. I think there are probably others who've studied uh, biblical Hebrew in seminary. Uh, I'll also say for the record that when I was growing up, I found Yom Kippur to be one of the most unpleasant and excruciatingly boring uh, moments of the year. Imagine being a 10-year-old sitting through a five-hour long religious service uh, in a foreign language on an empty stomach, mostly dwelling on how you've made a mess of the last year. Uh, not fun. So I am not speaking out of any sentimental attachment. Uh, um, in Judaism, Yom Kippur comes at the end of a 10-day official period of atonement that starts on the New Year's Day. So you've got 10 days to try to make your wrongs right. How do you do it? That's Maimonides' question. And I think his answers about the components of atonement come as close to the mark as any I've seen, which is why I want to talk to you about them. So for Maimonides, atonement involves four stages, confession, repentance, reparation, and apology. And let me go through these one by one. Confession, Maimonides emphasizes, means confession in words. Here's what he says. How does one confess? The penitent says, I beseech you, O Lord, I have sinned. I have acted perversely. I have transgressed before you and have done thus and thus, fill in the blanks, and lo, I repent, and I am ashamed of my deeds, and I will never do this again. The fuller and more detailed the confession one makes, the more praiseworthy is he. Now that last sentence is a little weird for a theist. You might think that since God knows everything that you do and everything you think in the most remote corners of your heart, you don't need to spell it all out. Not so, not so according to Maimonides. Um, now, here's how I want to try to make secular sense of this. You may feel you've done something wrong, but until you get it out in words, you don't know whether that feeling is something real. Furthermore, we all know that when you try to put memories into words, the memories become sharper, uh, and new material that you may have forgotten or may even have repressed comes up. That's one reason why putting it into words is much more than a mere formality. And it's crucially important in the cases uh, where you actually didn't do anything wrong, but merely feel that you did. Putting it into words allows you to examine it and judge it and ask yourself the question, should I feel remorse or should I downgrade to mere regret? Uh, so by having it in words and looking at it rationally, uh, you, that's something that's close to what we nowadays call cognitive therapy. Now, I should say not all the rabbis agreed that the fuller the confession, the better. If you make your confession too detailed and explicit, you run the danger of reliving your sin and getting off on it. Probably they were thinking of sexual sins, uh, where lingering on every single detail is tantamount to turning your confession into a little pornographic short story. Uh, so Rabbi Akiba quotes the book of Proverbs Confessing in every last detail is like a dog returning to his vomit. Uh, now, as I, as I suggested, the rabbis do like to argue, and perhaps Akiba and Maimonides are both right. The fuller the confession, the better, so long as you're taking care not to be getting off on it as you're confessing. Now, all of this rings true to me. There's another piece of Maimonides' theory of confession that I'm going to put out, even though I'm not sure I believe it. Um, he writes that to achieve perfect atonement, the oral confession should not only be this inward prayer to God, unless the sin was only against God and not your fellow human being. If you wronged a human being, the confession ought to be public. Otherwise, he says, atonement is imperfect. Now, public confession to the whole world strikes me as too much to ask. 
especially for someone who's laboring under a burden of shame and whose friends and family already thinks he's come back from the war changed for the worse, and actually they don't want to even hear the details. So it might be enough to do what some therapists do who work with morally injured soldiers, get them to, or warriors, get them to talk about what they did in a group with their fellow soldiers or Marines, who in any case might be the only people they trust enough to tell the story they need to tell. To my mind, confessing to that very special public is good enough, and it's entirely in the spirit of Maimonides' requirement to confess publicly. Now next, notice that Maimonides' formula for confession also includes repentance, which is what I've called the second stage of atonement. I repent and am ashamed of my deeds, and I will never do this again. Sincere resolve never to do it again is crucial to genuine atonement. The Mishnah warns, uh, here I'm quoting, if one says, I shall sin and repent, sin and repent, no opportunity will be given to him to repent. If one says, I shall sin, and the day of atonement will procure atonement for me, the day of atonement procures for him no atonement. Maimonides explains repentance two ways, um, one mental, I'll say, and one practical. So repentance, he says, consists in this, that the sinner abandon his sin, remove it from his thoughts, and resolve in his heart never to repeat it. That's the mental side. In practice, repentance means that when an opportunity presents itself, here I'm quoting again, for repeating the offense once committed, the offender, while able to commit the offense, nevertheless refrains from doing so because he is penitent and not out of fear or failure of vigor. So, so much for confession and repentance. The other two components of atonement are reparation and apology. Like the first two, they go together, and here's what Maimonides writes. Transgressions against one's fellow men, as for instance, if one wounds, curses, or robs his neighbor, or commits similar wrongs, are never pardoned till the injured party has received the compensation due to him and has also been appeased. Even though he has made the compensation the wrongdoer must also appease the one he has injured and ask his forgiveness. Now, admittedly, Maimonides is writing for a local, physically connected community. Uh, you can't realistically expect a veteran with a modest pension, a pile of bills and medical issues to locate a victim 8,000 miles away whose name he doesn't know and compensate that victim or the family. So, in practice, we're going to need to find some kind of second best substitute, a surrogate of some kind. Um, and uh, you know, here, I must confess that I haven't thought through what the various alternatives might be, but uh, they might be something like putting, I'm going to go back and find that family and make amends on my bucket list. Or I am going to do some kind of good works, maybe even specifically with an aid group for the country in which I fought. Um, now, in some cases, the U.S. government has offered condolence or salacia payments. We heard earlier today $750 for three dead family members, obviously not sufficient. Um, I actually think that public payments of that sort are a good way that we, the people, as a collective entity, can help lift at least that part of the moral burden of reparation from the individual warrior, and there should be more of it. Now, obviously, in some cases, everything's impossible. Take the obvious case, the victim's dead. Here's what Maimonides has to say. Bring a quorum of witnesses to the grave and publicly confess the sin. Then pay the condolence money, the compensation to the survivors, or if there aren't any, to the authorities. That's his version of a second best solution. Realistically, though, I think that then in the context of today's military, reparation in the sense of full compensation, uh, material compensation, is likely impossible. And some sort of symbolic reparation, um, an apology will have to substitute. One of the Marines that Wood discusses at the suggestion of his therapist wrote a letter of apology to the man he had killed. Uh, it's by no means 
what Maimonides calls perfect atonement. Uh, is it good enough? I don't know, probably not, but nobody said atonement is going to be easy or always possible. As for doing good works as a form of reparation, I, one part of the Yom Kippur service says that uh, tzedakah, giving charity, um, of, um, in the words of the service, averts the harsh decree. There's one other fascinating piece of Maimonides' discussion of apologies. He tells us that if a person asks someone for forgiveness and the other person won't forgive after repeated attempts, and when you go to ask forgiveness, you bring witnesses with you, no less. I mean, he's very legalistic about this. Um, then the sin transfers over to the person who won't forgive. Now, <clears throat> why is that relevant? I think it's relevant because it does suggest that sometimes there's atonement available, even if you haven't been able to fulfill the, def the condition of getting forgiveness in the person you've warned or uh, har wronged. So let me recap what I draw from Maimonides' short but deep discussion of atonement. First, atonement requires putting your story into words and confessing it to your God if you believe in God, to yourself if you don't, and preferably out loud to the circle of those you trust probably your military peers who lived through the same hell you did. Second, atonement requires repentance, the genuine resolve to change yourself and not repeat the, war, the wrong. Third, to the extent possible, atonement requires reparation. Fourth, atonement requires apology, asking for forgiveness. Repentance without apology is just writing a check. Uh, or sorry, reparation without apologies, just writing a check. And why should a victim forgive you if all you're doing is writing a check? Now, here's how I understand the whole theory put together. Confession and repentance have to do with the person who's seeking atonement. Reparation and apology are relational. Their aim is to repair the broken relationship between the wrongdoer and the victim. And Maimonides insists on both. To atone for a wrong, you must get right with yourself, but also get right with your victim. I'd add, do that at least symbolically, even if you can't do it practically. Now, it won't have escaped you that Maimonides is writing from a very particular cultural tradition, the Jewish tradition of a public ceremony of collective atonement. Um, he's telling you in a blueprint, uh, detailed blueprint what the atonement part requires. Now, this is a solemn ceremony, as solemn as it gets. At the crucial moment, part of the Yom Kippur service, the entire congregation arises and publicly confesses in unison to a long list of sins and transgressions. And traditionally, as you recite each sin, you symbolically strike your breast. Now, here's my confession. When I was growing up, this part of the service drove me up a wall with fury. Why should I, a 10-year-old, stand up and confess to adultery um, and a host of other sins that I hadn't committed and some of them I couldn't even imagine yet? Um, it seemed stupid and it seemed irrational and really offensive. Now today, I better understand the point of this public ritual of self-abasement. It really has two points and I think they both matter for us. One is that by getting everyone to confess out loud to everything, the congregation gives cover to the people who actually committed the sin. You don't know who the actual sinners are, so it relieves their stigma um, while allowing those who are guilty to fulfill the commandment to say it in words. So giving cover um, to a, a wounded, a morally injured warrior uh, so that they're able to confess, I think, is crucial. And there's a deeper reason for this part of the ritual. Collective confession means shared responsibility. The entire community takes responsibility for the misdeeds of its members. I think this idea should resonate very deeply in the professions of arms. From the very first day of basic training, a primary goal is to turn a bunch of callow individualists into a team, a unit, an us, whose members can trust each other with their lives. The professionals who work with morally injured warriors agree that no injuries run deeper than experiencing the death or harm of a teammate. 
One of Jonathan Shea's harshest critiques of the Vietnam era military was that it offered no opportunities for stricken units to grieve together collectively for their dead. In the immediate moment, there was no safe time to mourn. In the aftermath, units didn't demobilize together. Individual soldiers rotated out one by one. Collective grieving and mourning were tr desperately important, but impossible. So in Shea's words, the key to healing is this, communalize the trauma. I would say the same thing about atonement. Communalize the atonement. The wartime transgressions may be committed by warriors at the tip of the spear, but everybody knows that the shaft of the spear consists of hundreds or even thousands of other men and women all along the supply line. Uh, and in a democracy, we the people are at the other end of the spear from the tip of it. Um, uh, we the people ought to take responsibility for sending our young men and women into combat. Their, own, their moral injuries are suffered by them alone, but the atonement could and should be collective. And this is gonna take me to my final thoughts. One type of moral injury that both Shea and Wood focus on comes from the warrior's sense of betrayal by others, notably by their own political and military leaders. They sent us to fight without adequate equipment and my teammate died. They put us in an impossible situation where we couldn't help but kill civilians. They told us we were in Iraq because Saddam had WMDs, but there were no WMDs. Uh, now, why do I mention the moral injuries that come from betrayal? Obviously, a betrayed soldier or sailor or Marine has nothing to atone for. And then we have to think about their moral injuries in completely different terms that I've been talking about. But the leaders have plenty to atone for, even if they don't experience any moral injury or I would say especially if they don't experience any moral injury. That highlights the fundamental point that I learned from the army chaplain five years ago. Moral problems aren't the same as medical problems. Um, in our wholly justified desire to heal pain, we should remember that moral problems call for moral solutions. Thanks. Who's take, um, shall I take the, you want to just go to that microphone or I've got one here. Thank you very much. Is this on? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for your comments. Um, your point about collective atonement. Thank you for bringing that up. And I would just like to go back just for a bit to a previous panel and then, and then bring you back in if I could, sir. Um, I think that Aristotle said this or wrote this, it's that in order to fight a just war, you must have virtuous soldiers, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, sailors, etc. However, it is the virtuous that are at most risk to moral injury because their consciences have been assaulted. I'm not sure he said the latter part. But so if you subscribe to that, and I happen to subscribe to that, and so we, we want to build, develop the most virtuous soldier, airman, sailor, Marine we can but yet we're putting them at risk of moral injury because they are good people, good consciences, and they are involved in one of the most vulgar activities in the world, which is killing another human being. So I guess the answer to that is let's just uh, recruit psychopaths and then we don't have to worry about being anybody morally injured. Of course, that is, uh, would not be appropriate. And I didn't understand how much of a sin war was and how important collective atonement is until I read a book by the late uh, William Mahady titled Out of the Night, The Spiritual Journey of Vietnam Veterans, which I think is one of the finest books on moral injury and re relating it to the theological aspect of moral injury. Could you, could you say the title and author once again? Because I know there are people taking notes on our increasing reading list here. Yeah, it's uh, William Mahady, okay. M-A-H-E-D-Y. The book is titled Out of the Night, the Spiritual Journey of Vietnam Veterans. I believe it was published in the late 70s or early 90s. Uh, he is, uh, was an Augustinian brother for 20 some odd years, became a Catholic priest, became an army chaplain, served in Vietnam for a tour, uh, got out, started the Vietnam Veterans, I, I think they called it the RAP program after Vietnam, 
and then he uh, decided to get married and became a, a Lutheran minister. Episcopal. Episcopal. Thank you for correcting me, Wally. And from that book, I learned war is a sin. How didn't I know that? I mean, that's the obvious. But I didn't realize the depth of what that really means and how it contributes to the moral injury of our servicemen and women. My father is a uh, World War II veteran, Korean War veteran, and I didn't realize the post-traumatic stress that he suffered, uh, being involved with the invasion of Iwo Jima, killing a, a Japanese officer, writing home about it, and I didn't understand this until I received his letters from my aunt, his sister, that he wrote to. An amazing um, journey that he led, the anxiety. And he dealt with it with booze, just like so many other veterans of World War II. But they were fortunate because they were able to, after the invasion, or in, in, in invasions, they were able to return to a place where they could recover and recuperate. Unlike what's happening to our veterans today, multiple deployments. When I was in Iraq, 15-month deployments, and it was, uh, the, the soldiers were exhausted. Um, the last thing I'd like to, to say in answer to the question is, I believe that we have become cavalier in how we uh, train our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, in being involved in the vulgarities of war. And I am guilty of that because I was part of that, uh, part of that problem as a chief of staff for a division preparing Marines to deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan. So the real question is, when it gets back to collective atonement, the real question is, what about the moral virtues of the institution? Perhaps we should spread the spotlight to the moral virtues of our institution. And are we doing it right? Are we preparing our soldiers to deploy in harm's way adequately, mentally, spiritually, and physically? I would say no. And we're doing them irreparable harm. And I think we need to figure this out as an institution because it's we should atone. We should be asking our, these veterans for forgiveness. And we need to learn from what they did. And they, I believe it's they truly understand the nature of war. And they need to educate us, and we need to learn, not just lessons, or lessons learned, but take these lessons identified and turn them into lessons learned. So thank you for your, the bringing up the matter of collective entombment. I think it's huge and is yet to be addressed by the U.S. military. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I, sh I should say that uh, every aspect of what I talked about was something in which, it, if, you, if you think it's right, you should say, well, how do you turn that into, you know, from an 11th or a 12th century text into a 21st century set of institutions and practices? And that's, that's the question that I want to leave everybody with. My question is, has to do with um, the just war tradition. Augustine says that uh, in order for a war to be justified, it has at least in part be declared by a responsible authority. In the United States, that responsible authority is Congress, and ultimately it's the American electorate because we elect the members of Congress. Beginning on December 9th, 1941, we have never declared war. There's never been a, another declaration of war. We've had police actions, we've had insurgencies, we've had all kinds of things, but we've not had a direct um, a declaration of war. So we've, we've sort of uh, hidden ourselves behind the uh, presidential authority to, uh, to uh, insert troops. Given that reality that we all have to live with, and given your, I think, really insightful notion that atonement is a collective activity, how can we, how can we justify, and therefore how can we help uh, wounded warriors with uh, moral injuries atone when there is no moral authority to having began the war to begin with? And can we ever really serve uh, in a combat situation as American citizens? Yeah, um, there is many of you who teach the just war philosophy know there has been a debate for the last couple of decades between um, what I'll call the traditional view of just war theory in which the use ad bellum and the use in bellow were sharply distinguished. And uh, therefore, the fighters on both sides of a war, regardless of whether it's just, provided that they adhere to the use in bellow, uh, are doing something that is uh, equally 
blameless or blameworthy. And there's a, a kind of pushback tradition which actually has some ancient roots uh, called revisionism in which uh, the, uh, the killings that are done by the unjust side of a war, assuming that there is a just side, a just and an unjust side, uh, are not justified. Now, what, what I think your question raises, and this came up uh, in one of my categories of discussion today, is that uh, you know, even though we, we officially believe the standard version, um, the individual um, point of the spear warfighter may be experiencing some revisionist just war theory guilt. Um, it probably won't be uh, of the size of, oh, I am in an unjust war, but it might be the disillusionment that comes from thinking my leaders are lying because I actually see what's here on the ground and what they're saying on CNN is not what's here on the ground. And that kind of a disconnect, I think, is exactly what you're talking about. Now, is there a way for, this, for citizens to take responsibility for it? There is a way, I mean, whether there's a will of citizens to take responsibility for it, I think is, uh, is a deeper question. You know, I think in the, in the early 2000s, you know, there was a huge level of, uh, I think, militaristic enthusiasm. I mean, this was the period, you know, I was saying this to someone earlier, when uh, like every, you know, every 25-year-old civilian dude was buying a Hummer. Um, and, and that was really a kind of false taking of responsibility for the war that we're fighting. A true taking of responsibility for the wars that we're fighting um, involves a kind of deliberation and thinking and demanding truths. Um, and we have not gotten so good at that as a nation. Um, so, in Rudolph with Atonement, you mentioned in step one in the confession that he might realize that he uh, has, is, not, is just in regret and not in remorse, but what does Rudolph do with the other steps, particularly with uh, retributions? Do you think that even though he has done nothing wrong, he's obligated to re give retributions? And if not, what further steps does he have to take for atonement? Yeah, that's something that I've been, I thought about, and I, I don't have a really well worked out answer. But here's what I came up with: um, it, once he's once he fully understands, you know, has ex, you know, make made it, make it explicit. Here's exactly what happened that day. Here's what happened in that two minutes. Um, then one possibility is coming to understand and internalizing that in fact what he did was not a transgression. But what if he can't do that? Uh, it would be absurd to say you need to atone for something that isn't an actual wrongdoing, but it might be, now we're moving, I think, from the moral to the treatment side. It might be that going through some of the forms of atonement is still what, uh, what he needs to get, to feel like he's getting back on the right side of that boundary you don't shoot kids boundary that he feels that he's broken. So, you know, this could be something that's more symbolic and more kind of ritualistic and not strictly speaking morally required. Hi, sir, Jeff Matzler. I'm, I'm a retired army chaplain. And uh, one thing I'd like to, um, to, ask you, to ask you a question about something that you said uh, that I think was really powerful. When you talked about the two different kinds of moral injury, I, I concur, the, um, especially the part about the feeling of betrayal and how that's different. Um, I, I want to suggest that uh, a lot of our soldiers or a lot of our, um, uh, a lot of our personnel experience both of those uh, at the same time. Uh, I want to share something and then ask a question about it. Um, okay. uh, during the surge uh, back in 2009, uh, was coming back on leave, and if any of y'all did that at the time, that's one of the most surreal experiences you can have is you know, leave, leaving a fob and six days later being at home with your family for, for seven days. But um, a, a, along with, you know, I was on an airplane on 747 with, uh, with hundreds of soldiers, uh, most of those junior enlisted coming back. 
uh, sitting next to one of those on the, on the way home, uh, coming from Shannon, Ireland, I sat down next to a young man and uh, had a conversation with him that probably every chaplain in this room has had with, with anyone that they've sat down with at that point. And he asked me, he said, you know, chaplain, I've had to kill a lot of people. Will God ever forgive me? And, uh, and we talked about that. And we had a long, the flight from Shannon's a long flight into Atlanta. So we had a long time to talk about that. Um, when we came, when we got to Atlanta, uh, for those of you who, who came back, you know what they do? They put you all down in a holding area, put you on an escalator, and you come up the escalator to come back into the United States for the first time. And um, as we did, and I was standing right behind this young man on the escalator, there's a ring of about 200 people clapping and cheering uh, as we came up the escalator, and he just collapsed in on himself, you know, because he understood what he was doing as something that was wrong. And he also, whether he cognitively understood it or not, was being perceived, uh, the people around him to be saying, good job, we're glad you're doing what you're doing. Now, I understand that wasn't the intent of the people. The people were doing their very best to, to support us and to say, we're behind you in it. But uh, if atonement, if, if atonement for those who feel betrayed uh, only comes when those above us have apologized. How do we even convince the people of this nation who aren't part of this 1% that there's something to even atone for? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's a tremendously important question. Um, yeah, I'm old enough to have uh, I, I was, I did not serve, I'm a lifelong civilian, but I'm of the Vietnam generation, and I'm old enough to remember how shamefully returning vets were treated um, coming back from Vietnam. Uh, and I think that the reaction that we've seen in the post 9-11 wars is an American public that uh, wants to not make the same mistake twice. Um, so there can be a kind of, uh, you know, the, you know, as they, everybody says, the, the thank you for your service and the applause. Uh, but all of that may be done without any kind of knowledge of, uh, of what's, you know, what those uh, returning warriors have been through and what they've done and the burdens that they're carrying. How do you get that kind of dialogue going? Uh, this is David Wood's book asks that question in a really cogent form at the end. Um, thinks, look, you, you don't want the situation where you know, the warrior comes, uh, it's a big Thanksgiving dinner, and after everybody's eaten and are sitting around, somebody says, well, tell us about what it was like. And the moment that that person starts telling about what it's like, gradually people are leaving the room because it's making them kind of ill. Um, so there has to be a kind of listening. What Wood suggests is, you know, you know, a couple of experiences like that are just going to shut somebody down. I mean, this is part of the reason that I wanted to bring up the kind of covering aspect of, uh, what, of what I like about the collective confession at uh, Yom Kippur, that it allows somebody to confess when they actually have a burden to carry. Uh, so he thinks uh, realistically it better just be your fellow Marines or your fellow soldiers, a small group of them. Um, but ultimately it has to be uh, citizens who say, tell me what it's like to the extent that you're comfortable telling me what it was like, and then actually want to hear it and not get up and leave the room. And if they want to hear it, then maybe they exercise some more political responsibility um, you know, when they're talking about the wars that we fight. That's the best I can do.